What a wonderful season to be coming into. This is the season that we get to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And as joyous as that is to some, statistics tell us that majority of Americans have a very hard time in the month of December. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. Some of it has to do with it being the end of the year and us reflecting back on what we would have, could have, and should have did but didn't. Some of it's dealing with our jobs, like the people that we we're praying for today. Companies begin to lay off at the end of the year to try to save on their overhead, but it affects families in a very tough way. Some people that have lost loved ones, they begin to really remember them around the holidays and Thanksgiving leading into Christmas, and it becomes very hard because they miss them and they wish that they were here with them. And so statistics tell us that overwhelmingly Americans are torn during the holiday season. They're torn between feeling joyous for the reason that we celebrate the whole thing for and then all these other things that are going on. And that has led to the enemy using this season that should be the most celebratory time of the year for everyone into really one of the darkest times in the year for most. December leads the year in suicides per month. That's how much the enemy's working over time to try to undo what God has set forth for us to enjoy. And what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do through this series over the next three weeks is to leave not a single shadow of a doubt within you, in your body, your soul, or your spirit, that God is with you and that God is for you. And if God be for you, then who can be against you? I believe with everything on the inside of me that when this series is over, that every single one of us will have a brand new outlook. Because we're going to look at God in all of his entity. God in what we refer to as the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And we're going to look all the way throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament leading in to Christmas Eve services, which, by the way, this year's Christmas Eve, I'm promising you, is going to be the best we've ever done. Last year was the best one we've ever had. This one's going to be even better. If you've never made it, make it. If you've never brought friends, bring them. It's incredible. It's only about 45 minutes long, but it is absolutely amazing way to worship Jesus. But these three weeks we're going to look at, the word God, Elohim, is God supreme, but God himself is three personalities. There's three different persons wrapped up into one. We can't fully grab a hold of the understanding of it, but we just have to trust and understand and know that God the Father is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the one that breathed life into mankind. He is the one that sent his son into the earth to give his life as a ransom for all. He is the one. He is the one who when he put brought Jesus back to heaven after the resurrection... Then he sent his spirit to not just dwell with us, but dwell within us on this earth. And then Jesus, the son, God, the son, he is the reason for the season. Without him, there is no connection. Humanity was broken. Adam and Eve caused a major fracture, a divide between us and God. And there was always a plan that God had in place, and he brought it to fruition when he brought Jesus into the earth. What Jesus would do is he would give his life as a ransom on the cross of Calvary, and as his arms were spanned across that cross, he was laying one hand on God and one hand on all humanity. He was bridging the gap, repairing the breach. He was giving us an opportunity to come into a relationship with God as we were all created to be. And then the Spirit of God, God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He has been sent to dwell on the inside of every believer, to guide you, to nurture you, to comfort you, to protect you, to to lead you, to send you all that God has promised to you. And what we want to look at every week is one piece of the personality of the three parts of God. And today, as we are coming into the Christmas season, we're going to kick it off with Jesus. We're going to look at the Son of God. God the Son. What does he have to do 
with God being with us. He has everything to do with it. His name is it. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the angel says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the very name of Jesus means God's with you. So that you can never forget it. That you can never misunderstand it again. And every time that you declare the name of Jesus within your life, you are declaring, God is with me. Every time you speak the name of Jesus, you are speaking, God is with me. Every time you sing the name of Jesus, you are singing, God is with me. Every time, that's why you should use the name of Jesus no matter what you're facing. When the enemy's in your ear lying to you, manipulating you, just begin. If you don't know what else to say, just begin to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because you're declaring, God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. When they lie about you, just say Jesus. When they cheat on you, just say Jesus. When they abandon you, just say Jesus. When they plot to kill you, just say Jesus. When they gossip about you, just say Jesus. Because they are proving that God is not with them because they're being used of the enemy to attack God's people. And all you got to do is just say Jesus. Jesus. Oh, sorry. No, that was Chris Gilkey's version of Jesus. Just give him, a, <laughs> give him one of those whipping ones. Jesus, he is with us. What does that mean? Humanity was lost from God. When Satan deceived Adam and Eve in the garden, humanity was created to have a relationship with God. And the only place that you could ever truly encounter God in this earth was in the temple of God. And inside of the temple of God laid a place called the Holy of Holies. It was protected with this veil that was hung above the door because everybody had to know that no one could enter into there because this deal was kept back to called the Ark of the Covenant. And inside of the Ark of the Covenant was where the glory of God was contained. Nations went to war over the Ark. People divided themselves against their family over the ark. And the glory of God was so powerful within the ark of the covenant that only one person alone could walk in there, the high priest. But when he did, he was going in there to try to get atonement, to try to get forgiveness for everyone else's sins, but if he had a hidden sin that he had going on in his life that nobody else knew about but he and God did, then he was in trouble. And they used to sew bells around the hem of the high priest's garment and then tie a rope around his ankle before they sent him on in. And you know what all the other jokers out there were doing? They were like, just waiting. We're going to hear a jingling ling. If you do, start pulling. Drag that dead body out of there. They said, oh my God, it's a true story. If the high priest went in with hidden sin, then... He was struck dead in the presence of God. Thank God we live in a new covenant. And then once he was down, we still had to get atonement for people's sins, so they would be like, next. <laughs> and the second in command dude was like, yo, I was not ready for this. Like, I'll step down from my position. Take the next one. I ain't, I ain't getting struck dead. But think about this. One day they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant in, and they stumbled and it shook and somebody reached out just to stabilize it. And the man was struck dead for doing it. And this Ark was held behind the veil, but at the moment that Jesus was on the cross, when he took his last breath and he said, it is finished. A great earthquake came and shook everything, including the temple. And within the temple, the veil that was hanging up to guard the Holy of Holies from everybody, it was torn in two. Why? How? The ark is exposed now. The glory of God is for everybody to see. Why? 
Because when Jesus stretched his arms out on that cross, when Jesus became the lamb who took on all of our suffering and all of our sin, no longer was the glory of God to be held in a box behind a curtain, but now the glory of God was to be held on the inside of every single believer, every person that would say yes to Jesus. And that brings us to number one. He lives in you. God is with you. Jesus is with you. He's with you so much. He lives on the inside of you. Ephesians 3, 17. Then Christ will make, everybody say in orange together, his in your heart as you trust in him. He's going to make his home in your hearts. We've been made in the image of the Trinity. We have been made three parts as well, body, soul, and spirit. Our body relates to the environment. Our soul is our mind, will, emotions. It's how we think, how we feel, what we desire. And then our spirit relates directly to God. And often, all the way throughout the scripture, our spirit is always referenced to as our heart. And it lays dormant within us until we say yes to Jesus. And then Jesus brings by his spirit our spirit to life. That's why you were born again. That's why you're filled up when you say yes to Jesus. That's why something happens on the inside of you that you can't explain. And your roots, they will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. So here's the bottom line. If you want to stay strong, well, then you got to go down deep into God's love. And the only way to go down deep into God's love is to let your roots grow down. And the only way to let your roots grow down is to make sure that you trust in him. And the only way to trust in him is to allow him to live in you. And this is what God wants for each and every single one. He wants to live in you vibrantly. And he wants to live through you. And that brings us to number two. He will always, always be with you. Sometimes we feel like, yeah, I know that he's like kind of living in me, but, you know, it's not really like he doesn't live in me like he does in you, Pastor. I say, no, 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 that's just totally wrong. I'm just allowing him to live through me a little bit more maybe than others, and there's others that are surely doing it more than I am. Everybody's in a different place in their journey. It's not about whether God lives more in me than in you. That's not even possible. God lives in you. He lives in you. And you feel like, yeah, but I'm, you, don't, you don't know my background. Like, I know I said yes to him, and I know he's, he's forgiven me, quote, unquote. I see that a lot. Yeah, I know he's forgiven me. No, he's forgiven you. Stop doing quote, unquote. He's forgiven you. There's nothing, there's nothing in between. He's forgiven you. It's wiped out. It's gone. Quit reminding him. He's forgiven you completely. And he'll always be with you. And we feel like at times that, yeah, but I don't know that, like, is he really with me even, even when I'm not at my best? Yes. Is, is he with me even when I'm doing wrong? Yes. Is he with me when I'm not having the best of thoughts? Yes. See, what the devil loves to do, and Jesus gave the devil the nickname, the father of lies. What a nickname. The only way the Son of God would give such a nickname is if it fit the bill, and it fits the bill very well. Satan is the best liar I've ever known in my life. He is so good at it, he will take a little bit of the truth even, twist it, magnify it into a lie, and make everyone around believe it. He's very good at what he does, and this is what he loves to do to you. He loves to bring condemnation and guilt and shame into your life. He loves to make you think that, well, God was with you, until you had too many last night with your friends. How dare you come to church today knowing what you were just doing yesterday. How dare you up in here lifting your hands. Look at you lifting your hands. You should be ashamed of yourself. Last night you was lifting those hands in the club. You feel what I'm saying? This is what the devil does. How, da- how dare you speak the words of God. When yesterday you're just speaking ill against somebody in your, fa- in your friend circle or in your family. How dare you read the word of God with your eyes when just the day before you were looking at something on the internet you had no business looking at. This is what the devil loves to do. 
And I'm going to tick off some religious spirits when I say this. Maybe not here, but somewhere. I promise you it's about to get fired up. Is God with you when you are at your worst? Heck yes. He's with you when you're at your best. He's with you when you're at your worst. David said, if I will ascend to the highest of the mountains, he is there with me. When I make my bed in hell, he lies with me. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His promise is yes and amen. And if you will live for him, it means you must die for him. If you will suffer for him, Then you will reign with him. And here's the only catch. This is the only thing that causes God to deny us. If you deny him, you leave him no choice but to deny you. And then the next part's the most powerful of them all. But even when you are unfaithful, he is still faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Hear it and hear it clearly, family. I'm not giving you a license to go out and do whatever you feel like doing just because God's always going to be with you. That's just stupid. I know God's with me, but it doesn't give me the right to go out and offend God or hurt other people by my actions. God is with me whether I do right or wrong. He is with me. Now, I'm going to tell you, if it's in the wrong part, if I'm doing wrong and God is with me, then God's probably most likely about to discipline me. And when I'm doing right, he's encouraging me. Look at Matthew 28, verse 20. These Teach these things to the new disciples. In other words, every single person you lead to Jesus, make sure they understand these two things. One, to obey the commandments I have given you. And two, be sure of this. I am with you how often? Always. Always. I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And the devil wants to torment you. He wants to take every mistake you ever make. He wants to make sure that he twists every little thing, every thought that you've had, every time you got angry driving in this beautiful, wonderful traffic in Austin that brings me just peace and joy every time I'm on the road. Every time. You want to give the one-fingered peace sign. You know what I'm saying? Like every time. Every single time, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. You can't outrun him. You can't evade him. He said, I'll leave the 99 and I'll come after you. I'll find you. I'll love you enough to carry you back to the to fold. And what if, but what if, what if, what if that, that one keeps on leaving? He's surely going to, no, 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 no. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. This is who he is. And it's proven over and over again in a wonderful way with number three. Nothing can separate you from him. Nothing can. Somebody say nothing. Nothing. Romans 8, 38 through 39. And I am convinced. It means I am 100% confident of one thing and one thing only. And that is nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels or demons. If a demon can't separate you from the love of God, then why can your little actions separate you from the love of God? Are you hearing me now? Everywhere you are, he is there. Every single place you go, he goes before you. He comes beside you. He's guarding your rear. God is with you. And nothing can separate that. If a demon can't do it, this is the thing that that the devil loves to do. is He loves to turn molehills into mountains. And I'm not excusing, listen to me, listen to me clearly. I hope and wish that all of us become so disciplined that we live the absolute most flawless, best life we can live for Jesus. But even when you pull that off, you're still not perfect. It's impossible. You're too fallible. And if you think you're perfect and you're without flaw, then that's your flaw. It's impossible while we're on this earth. 
He says that we will strive for perfection, but we will not reach perfection until the day that we are with him. Even while you were still yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Even while he knew every single bad thing you've ever done, every wrong thing you've ever done to hurt others or to hurt yourself, he still gave his life as a ransom for yours because he believes in you and because he loves you. And now all of a sudden we say yes to Jesus and we start walking around with fear that he's going to give up on us, that he's going to abandon us, that he's going to leave us because we're not perfect. Because the devil's good at what he does. And God's hammering it home over and over again throughout his scripture. Jesus, he can't be separated from you. Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. We just did that series two months back on Today Matters. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow brings enough trouble of its own. Focus on today. Tomorrow's not even promised. It may not be here. Why freak out about it? And don't let fear dominate your day. Because he did not give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a spirit of love and of a sound mind. Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. That's crazy. Not even the powers of hell can. So stop letting the devil trick you to make you think your decision yesterday has separated you from the love of God. It has not in the slightest. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, everybody said together. Nothing. And all creation will ever, ever be able to separate us from the love that God has revealed to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's because of him. Jesus is the reason. He is the reason not just for this season that we're in, but he is the reason why God no longer sees our filthy mess that we came out of. All God sees when you say yes to Jesus is he sees his son's blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, blanketing your body, covering you, and washing you as white as snow. He doesn't see your past, so stop reminding him. Are you hearing me? You screw up, you mess up, fess up, make it right, and move on. Don't live in the gutters of shame and guilt and pain. All of that is condemnation. And he says, in Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation. The only thing we live our life by and should live our life by is conviction. And let me tell you the difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation always makes you feel like crap. Makes you feel like you're, you're just worthless. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. What conviction does is conviction motivates you to be better. Conviction makes you feel good about a mistake. Like, yeah, I know I didn't do the best on that, but I learned from it. And I'm going to do even better the next time. Are you hearing me? God is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? A thousand may fall at your left side and 10,000 at your right. But no harm will come unto you because you are blessed. Coming in and going out. Everywhere your feet touch, everywhere your hands touch, everywhere your mouth speaks, you are blessed because God is with you. If you believe it, let's just give one big, big, big hand clap of praise to Jesus. Come on. Amen. Just can ask for a moment if we can bow our head and close our eyes. I think I scared a baby. Sorry. I want to extend an opportunity here just for a moment. I don't know your story. I don't know everything you've been through. I'm surely not here to judge you. God is not here. To judge you, Jesus said, I didn't come to judge you. I came to save you. If Jesus didn't come to judge, then who the heck do people think they are to judge? Nobody here. I, th I hope you felt that when you walked in the door today. Nobody here is here to judge you. We've, we've beaten that spirit out of here a long time ago. We never let it in. None of us are perfect. We've all got a past. 
We've all got mistakes. All of us still have struggles. But the most important part of all of this is, is you don't have to walk through it alone. Not only do you have a church family that can support you, but most importantly, when you say yes to Jesus, you have a God who lives on the inside of you, who guides you, who leads you, who helps you, who who strengthens you. And the only way to experience that is to believe. To believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He gave His life as a ransom for yours, and that all that you have to do is just say yes. That's all he's ever wanted. He's a perfect gentleman. He's not forcing himself on anyone. He just wants you to say yes. And if you're here today and you know that you got some baggage, you got some some old stuff you just need to give to God, you need to be forgiven of, you need to let go, you want your past wiped out, he said if you say yes to him, he'll take every sin you've ever done and he'll cast it as far as the east is from the west. He'll plunge into the depths of the sea and remember it no more. He's not only a forgiving God, he's a forgetting God. So if you want to say yes to Jesus and you want to experience this new life he promises you, or maybe you're here today and you... You've prayed this prayer before, but your life isn't living up the commitment that you made. Then recommit it today without fear, without worry on the count of three. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand nice and high in the air. And then we're going to pray a prayer with you right there in your seat. Without fear, without delay on three. Put those hands up. One, two, hands already going up. Three, come on, let me see them. Hands are up all over from left to right, front to back. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for those hands. For each and every one of you that raised that hand, just place it right on your heart. That's where Jesus is about to enter. I'm going to ask everybody here, let's all join in and pray this with them. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Son of God. You gave your life for me. Now I give my life to you. Forgive me for every sin, every mistake I've ever made. Give me a fresh start, a new beginning. From this day forward, I dedicate my life to you. Help me. Send to me your Holy Spirit to live it for you. In Jesus' name, amen.